and we're going to consider uh, this passage in both services today, uh, Ephesians 5 beginning in verse 22, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter, and uh, first we're going to consider it dispensationally and refute the traditional view that it teaches the church in this present age is the bride of Christ, and then in the next hour we'll consider its practical teaching on uh, Christian marriage. After all, that's what it's about <laughs> in its context. It's a practical passage. It's not a doctrinal statement about the bride of Christ. It's about Christian marriage. And uh, so let's begin by reading the passage, Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself in the sense of protecting and providing for. Um, when he's talking about loving yourself, talking about as you would take care of your own body, you now take care of your wife. Um, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, most dispensationalists, and I'm referring to those who would uh, use the Schofield Bible, um, they believe Israel was the wife of God in the Old Testament, God the Father, but the church in this age is the bride of Christ. And this is one of the main passages they go to to support that view. And that's the view presented in the notes of the Schofield Bible. Um, but please notice that nowhere in the passage did Paul say the church is the bride. You find the word as quite a bit. This is, he's making a, uh, an illustration, and um, it's figurative, but there's no doctrinal statement here about the church is the bride of Christ. In fact, that phrase is found nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere does the scripture say in the King James Bible, the bride of Christ. If you ask the average person that believes the church is the bride of Christ, you say, why do you believe that? They'll say, the Bible says that. But if you ask them which verse says that, they'll stumble around because it's not there. It doesn't say that in the Word of God. Now, we do read about the bride, the Lamb's wife. And, uh, of course, concerning Israel, how Christ is their Lamb, and that title is used in regard to them, um, and it's clear in the context of that phrase in the book of Revelation that she is identified with the nation Israel, not the body of Christ. Let's go ahead and look at that in Revelation 21. Without, you know, having preconceived ideas, just letting it stand as it is, when you read this passage, it's very clear who it's referring to. Revelation 21, verse 9. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. So that's great. We don't have to wonder who it is. I mean, the Word of God's going to clearly show us. All right? He carried me away into the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, it's not that the, you know, the materials the city's made out of is the, is the wife of the Lamb, but the, the inhabitants who inherit this as their primary inheritance. And I'm going to 
say, I'm not suggesting that you and I won't have any access to the city. We certainly will. But whose inheritance is it primarily according to the text? Let's keep reading. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. There are no twelve tribes in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a new creature. It's neither Jew nor Gentile. The, the Bible is very clear. So on the gates of the city called New Jerusalem, okay, not New Atlanta, New Jerusalem, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates, on, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That would not include Paul. He was not one of the 12 apostles. Judas Iscariot was replaced by Matthias in Acts chapter 1. And we can prove that from the word of God. Paul wasn't even qualified to be one of the 12 apostles. And Paul himself said he was not one of the 12. He said after Christ was raised, he was seen of the 12 and then of me. <laughs> he's not in the 12 apostles. He's not, he is an apostle, but he's the apostle of the Gentiles. Why are there 12 tribe, uh, excuse me, 12 apostles? I already gave the answer. Uh, there are 12 apostles who are sent to the 12 tribes of Israel, and Christ said they're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, Matthew 19, verse 28. And that's not all. There's 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 all over the city as you study it and consider the passage. Now, how are you going to take that and say that's all about us? I didn't say we wouldn't have access to it. We certainly will. But it's not our primary inheritance. According to the text, it's got to do with the nation Israel. Now, God gave Israel a bill of divorce for her unfaithfulness under the Old Covenant. But it was prophesied that He will yet take her back as a virgin bride under the New Covenant. And the New Covenant is made with the same people God made the Old Covenant with. The church in this age is not the covenant people of God. The covenants pertain to Israel, Paul said in Romans 9. Gentiles are strangers from the covenants of promise, Ephesians 2. Hebrews chapter 8 makes it crystal clear that the new covenants made with the house of Israel as it was prophesied in Jeremiah 31 and so on. So the scripture does not teach that the father and the son have two different wives. That's not biblical. The same one who spoke to Moses through the burning bush was married to Israel in the Old Testament. When he delivered his people out of Egypt, figuratively speaking, under that old covenant, she became his wife. This is a figure of speech, right? But it's used concerning Israel. And who was it speaking to Moses in the burning bush? Well, Jesus Christ said, before Abraham was, I am. That's John 8, verse 58. The Lord told Moses, I am that I am. Now, Stephen, filled with the Holy Ghost, so obviously he knew what he was talking about, when he was preaching to Israel, said in Acts 7, verse 30, that it was an angel of the Lord speaking to Moses in the burning bush. Now, who is that angel of the Lord? That's Jesus Christ, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took Israel unto himself under the old covenant. And so you don't have this, this idea of the father had Israel as a wife and now the son has a different wife. That's not how it is in the word of God. That may be how it is in some people's imagination, but you can't prove that from the scripture. If you'll just lay aside preconceived ideas received by religious tradition, and I'm telling you right now, most people that believe the church is the bride of Christ, they got it from a song or somebody's sermon. They didn't get it from studying the word of God rightly divided now you can go if you want to practice replacement theology and say we're Israel now that's how you try to make that work but we're not Israel and God's going to fulfill everything he promised Israel if you rightly divide the word of truth and study the scripture you won't come away with the idea that we're the bride spoken of in the book of Revelation I didn't say we're not likened unto a a bride or a wife 
in a figurative sense of what God's doing in this age. But that is a different thing from what he was speaking of in prophecy concerning Israel. Now, consider these following points. We're not running these references for time. I've taught on this before. I'm just reminding you of these points. And if you haven't wrote these references down, I encourage you to write these down and check them. I'm not going to read all these because we'll never get through this lesson this morning. But I'm going to give them to you. I've taught on this before. In fact, it wasn't that long ago, I think. We, we went through it pretty thoroughly in our study of the book of Revelation. And I mentioned it again recently in our study of the book of John. But if you consider these points and take them for what they say, you'll understand the bride spoken of in prophecy concerns Israel, not the body of Christ. All right, first of all, there are seven points, so we know it's a perfect outline, all right? Uh, number one, Israel became the wife of God under the Old Covenant. Jeremiah 2, verse 1 and 2. Now, the references I'm giving you, this is not all. There's a lot in prophecy about this, but I'm just giving you enough for you to study it out, and you can search and see the other references that are there. But Israel became the wife of God under the Old Covenant. Jeremiah 2, verse 1 through 2. Secondly, she constantly committed spiritual adultery against him with her idolatry. And you can read Jeremiah 3, Ezekiel 16, whole passages on this issue. Number three. After much long suffering, God gave her a bill of divorcement. That's what it says in Isaiah 50, verse 1, Jeremiah 3, verse 8. But number four, God promised to betroth her again as a virgin bride. Study Isaiah 61, beginning in verse 10, going through chapter 62, verse 5, also 11 and 12, verse 11 and 12, and then look at Hosea 2. The whole latter part of the chapter, especially verses 14 to 23, it's crystal clear if you just take it for what it says. So the forsaken wife will become a virgin bride by the blood of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, verse 1 to 4, verses 31 to 34. See, Schofield in his notes said something to the effect that an adulterous forsaken wife can never be called a virgin bride. And so Israel was the wife of the father, but the church is the bride of Christ. Well, what, what is he discounting there when he makes a statement like that? The blood of Christ, he said, I'll remember their iniquities no more. <laughs> I mean, he, so they are no longer, they're not going to be considered the saved nation. And I'm not talking about every Jew who ever lived. I'm talking about the saved, believing Israel of God. When they enter that new covenant, they will not be considered an adulterous, forsaken wife because the blood of Christ has taken away all their sins. All right, number four, uh, five. In his earthly ministry, Christ was presented to Israel as a bridegroom. He said, uh, John the Baptist said, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And that really messes up the Baptist briders right there that claim to follow John the Baptist and only the Baptist church is the bride of Christ. They're so fouled up, I can't even explain how fouled up they are. But that verse right there itself refutes that nonsense because even John the Baptist wasn't even in the bride, according to that statement that he's making. And I'm not going to get into all of that, but just to say, what was John the Baptist doing? He was the forerunner preparing the way of the Lord. And he said in John 1 verse 31, to manifest Christ to Israel... Therefore, am I come baptizing with water? And he said, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And if you understand what all was being said there, it's very clear that the bridegroom came in his earthly ministry to present himself to his bride as far as a new covenant with the house of Israel. Okay? <laughs> the body of Christ was still a mystery hidden God all the way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was not revealed till it was revealed to Paul. You can't put the body of Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and rightly divide the word of truth. We're not there. I didn't say nothing there applies. There's, there are things throughout all the scripture that apply in this age, if we're careful and we understand the context. But doctrinally speaking, who was Christ presenting himself to? He said, I'm not sent, but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he said. That's not what I think he said. That's not my interpretation of what, it's what he said, okay? Matthew 15, verse number 24. And that's why uh, the gospel of the kingdom is likened to a wedding invitation <laughs> in Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14, as far as that parable. Now, he was rejected by his nation. He came into his own, his own received him not. So that marriage has not been consummated. But, number six, when Christ comes again to the earth, the believing remnant of Israel who received him will be his bride and wife 
Under that new covenant, we're going to look at this in just a moment, but Revelation 19, verse 7 through 11, mark that down. And the Gentiles that feared God and blessed Israel will be guests at the marriage supper. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Luke 13, 24 to 30, verse, chapter 14, verse 15. Again, this is not even all, but that's enough, okay, if you look at these verses for what they say. And then number seven, this relationship will remain in the eternal state, as we were just were reading a moment ago in Revelation 21, that's the eternal state. She's still called a bride after a thousand years because the thousand-year reign of Christ is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage supper of the Lamb doesn't take place in heaven. It takes place on earth. That's why it's called Beulah Land. That's not heaven. That's Palestine. Okay, Israel's going to be married back to the land of promise, and the Lord's going to marry that nation back to himself under the new covenant. All this will be fulfilled, and it will, will remain in eternity that the bride, the Lamb's wife, Okay, now, Peter said a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years, one day, Second Peter 3, 8. And so that's why she's still called a bride after the millennial reign. The millennial reign was the marriage supper. Now, that, you leave that up there for a moment, guys, if you would. And if you, jot those down if you haven't. I'm telling you, search the scriptures. And this, this is not what I, this is not my opinion about it. This is just what it says. I mean, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Now. Guess how many times Paul said we're the bride? He didn't, okay? Because we're not. We have a different position. Now, the book of Revelation, and we're going back in just a moment to Ephesians 5. You say, well, what's it about then? We'll make it very clear. We'll show you that. But I'm just trying to show you what the real issue is here. The book of Revelation is, com is completely based on Old Testament prophecy, okay? Everything in it is in fulfillment of what was prophesied in the Old Testament. It is the consummation of God's prophetic kingdom program concerning Israel and the nations. So to claim the bride in Revelation is actually the mystery of the body of Christ. It is a failure to rightly divide the word of truth, and it leads to major doctrinal problems. Okay, so I'm not trying to nitpick and say, well, because most people think the church is the bride, I'm going to stand over here and say we're not, so I can look down on you and ha have a different view. Uh, no, I, I, the reason why this is so important and the reason why I'm making it an issue is because if you are consistent, which a lot of people aren't, but if you're consistent and you think we are the bride in Revelation, you've got major problems on your hands, okay? For example, that would mean we will not be permanently joined to the Lord until the second coming of Christ. Look in Revelation 19. Revelation 19. John was taken out in the spirit to be an eyewitness of the things he wrote in the book of Revelation. The whole book is future from this present age. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day is not talking about Sunday. It's talking about the prophetic day of the Lord. We, we won't be here for that. We're going to be caught up before that comes. The book of Revelation has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Okay, now we can, we can learn from it. That's why I taught through it. I've taught through it verse by verse twice. I wrote a book on it. So I'm not against studying it. I'm just saying you better know what it's about. It's not about you. Most false teachers, they love to go to the book of Revelation to teach some false doctrine in this age because they don't understand the book in its context. But Revelation 19, beginning in verse 7 Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb is. Come. What's the context? What's happening in the context? How about the end of verse 6? The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. How about verse 11? I saw heaven open, behold a white horse. It's the second coming. The marriage supper of the Lamb is come at the second coming, not the rapture. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. She's called the wife because betrothal is, is, is binding. And that's why Mary was called Joseph's wife before the consummation. His wife hath made herself, plus it was his former wife. He's remarrying her. And, uh, and, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness 
of saints. That's how she made herself ready. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. So Israel is not permanently joined to the Lord as a saved nation under the new covenant until the second coming of Christ. So if that's us, that means we're not joined to the Lord until the second coming of Christ. But we were joined to the Lord the moment we believed the gospel. Okay? So, no. Uh, number two, if, if this is us, then we have to endure the 70th week of Daniel to be in the bride. She made herself ready by overcoming the beast, by not taking his mark. She, was, she endured to the end. Matthew 24. We're not even going to be here for that. That can't possibly be us. Number three, if this is us, we have to make ourselves ready by our own righteousness. We, but Paul said in Philippians 3 that his righteousness was dung compared to the excellency of the knowledge of, of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. We're clothed in his righteousness upon salvation. We don't have to prove our faith by our works to be in the people of God. Under the gospel of the grace of God, we're justified by the faith of Christ, members of his body instantly and permanently, whereas under the gospel of the kingdom, it's a different situation. They have to prove their faith by their works. Number four, if this is true and this is us, that would mean we replaced Israel and God was not faithful to his promises to them. If you believe the bride in the book of Revelation is the church of this present age, that is replacement theology. Now, the, the odd thing is there are a lot of dispensationalists that reject replacement theology, but they, but they hold to it here. You know who teaches the church as the bride of Christ? The Roman Catholic Church. They teach replacement theology. The Protestants also. See, they protested, they just didn't protest enough. And they teach, by and large, replacement theology. And so... We lose nothing by understanding we're not in the bride because being a member of the body of Christ is a higher and a greater position than being in the bride anyway. Now, a husband and wife become one in marriage. I understand that. The Bible's clear on that. And we're going back to Ephesians 5 in just a moment. We're going to look at what the point is here. But even though a husband and wife become one flesh, they're still two different people. They're not, one, they're not literally one body like the church and Christ are one body. The body of Christ is completely identified with our head. So much so, Paul never refers to the church in the feminine sense, ever. Now, if you got a stupid ESV, and I'm sick of that translation, everybody touts it like it's some brilliant translation, it's a piece of garbage. Amen and amen. So I don't like it. I don't care because I'm telling you the truth. It's got false doctrine in it. I get irritated. You ought to get angry about false doctrine being, the leaven of false doctrine being put in these new Bibles. The ESV just goes in there in Ephesians 5 and says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And it, instead of saying it all through there, it keeps saying her and she. And they just take liberty to change the word of God. It's, not, it's, it's, it's neuter in the, in, in the original languages. So they're not translating. They're just commenting with their theology. Well, I just brought this to the pulpit to show you, for example, because some people say, oh, that, what you're saying is some new idea. Man, this book right here, this was from Things to Come Journal in April 1915. Now, I've got one at the house from 1895 that has a similar article, and they're showing that the church in this age is not the bride. It's not, this is not a new idea. People who take the Bible literally and rightly divided understand this. Most evangelical believers hold as axiomatic truth that the church of this age is the bride of Christ, although such a term as this last is not found in Scripture. The bride, the wife of the Lamb is a scriptural term, and its occurrence in the book of Revelation indicates the church is not that bride. The belief seems to be induced somewhat thus. The prophets teach that Israel is the wife of Jehovah. The Israel of the prophecies having been put away and the election merged into the church, the relationship falls to the Israel of God on whom Paul called down a benediction in Galatians 6, verse 16, and that Israel is the church. In other words, he's saying this is where they get the idea. But he said, unless words are meaningless, 
There's no ground for supposing that the Israel of God is other than the elect of Israel, the law, and the prophets. And he goes on to show about Galatians 6 that actually it's two different groups. Galatians 6.16 6, proves that the Israel of God is, is a separate group from the new creature. In the King James Bible, in Galatians 6, he distinguishes between the Israel of God and the new creature. That's two different groups. And he wrote that during the transition period where both were operating. Israel, the Israel of God is the believing Israel. Israel. <laughs> the new creature is not Israel. It's a new creature. How's it new if it's Israel? But he distinguishes. But guess what the ESV and all the rest of these modern perversions do? They change the text in Galatians 6 to make the church the Israel of God. If you use new versions of the Bible, you will be greatly hindered in understanding dispensational truth. I mean, after all, they removed the very key in 2 Timothy 2.15. They won't tell you to rightly divide the word of truth. They also take the word dispensation out, by and large, in most of these versions. So the King James Bible is a supernatural book given to us by God, not the translators. The King James translators were not dispensationalists, but they produced a dispensational masterpiece because the Holy Spirit made sure they did. But the modern versions corrupt all that. And so I'm telling you, if you study this out, the church being the bride of Christ is replacement theology. And so what happens is, is you've got people that they use a Schofield Bible as their final authority. And because Dr. Schofield said the church is the bride, if you get up and say it's not, they say you're a hyper-dispensationalist. Now, hyper means you've gone beyond. Have I gone beyond? Yeah, I've gone beyond Schofield. Have I gone beyond the Scripture is the question. I'm telling you what the Scripture says. Schofield didn't have it all figured out, and I think he'd be ashamed to know people are using his Bible like it's some kind of authoritative. He put some notes in there to try to be a help. But man, he also attacked the Word of God in a number of places. And I, I, I appreciate some of the good things he said, but you cannot follow a man. You've got to follow the Word of God, and the Word of God is clear on these matters. All right, back to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, trying to just set the table, because if you understand what prophecy says about the bride issue and how it's going to be fulfilled in the book of Revelation, you won't be reading that into a passage about the body of Christ, which was a mystery hid from the prophets. The reason so many believe Paul teaches the church as the bride of Christ in Ephesians 5 is they read it into it. And they're not considering it in context. All right, in the doctrinal section of Ephesians, the first three chapters, there's doctrine all through, but the emphasis of doctrine is in chapters 1, 2, and 3. The application of the doctrine is 4, 5, and 6. What is Paul emphasizing? What is the theme of this doctrinal epistle? It is that the church is the what? The body of Christ. I mean, in Ephesians 1, 22, he said, put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. Fullness of him that filleth all in all. How about chapter 2, verse number 15? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, to make in himself of twain one new bride, one new woman. No, it says one new man. Now, if your bride's a man, you got serious problems. All right? No, one new man, the body, not the bride. One new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And then in Ephesians 3, of course, the whole passage is talking about how it was a mystery hid from the prophets. It was hidden God. It was first revealed to Paul. And what is that mystery in verse 6? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, takers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. All right, so it's all through there in chapter 4. One body. Chapter 4 also talks about the edifying of the body of Christ. I mean, the body of Christ, that's all you're reading about coming up into chapter 5, and all of a sudden we're supposed to believe in chapter 5. Now Paul, in the middle of a passage of applying the doctrine concerning the body, is going to make a detour and, and, and show us how the church is actually the bride. 
No, see, the passage here is in the practical section of the epistle, and Paul is applying the doctrine of the body of Christ to our walk. How does the doctrine of the body of Christ apply to Christian marriage? All right, got a chart to show you. It's very simple. This is very, very simple. Christ and his church are one body. Well, husband and wife are one flesh. They're not the same body. They become one as far as that relationship is concerned, but there's, two, there's still two different people, okay? So there's a difference there of saying one body, the same body, and one flesh. There's a difference. But anyway, Christ is the head of the church. Well, the husband is the head of the wife. Well, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands. And as Christ loved the church, husbands love your wives. He's saying if you know this doctrine, it ought to, inf it ought to impact you in every area of life, including your marriage. So he's taking the, the, the spiritual reality of our relationship with Christ between Christ and the church, and he's saying that ought to impact even your marriage because just like Christ loved the church, husbands, you ought to love your wives. And just like the church is subject to Christ, wives be subject to your husbands and so on. That's what he's doing. It's very practical. He's not making any doctrinal statement about the church being the bride of Christ. He doesn't say it's the bride of Christ. He says, as, 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 all through there. He doesn't say he is. I pulled this quote from Sir Robert Anderson, highly respected. And he was the head of the Scotland Yard. And uh, he wrote the, the, the tremendous work called The Coming Prince about the Antichrist. So he, was, uh, uh, he had a government position, but he was also a teacher and preacher. And... Uh, Sir Arthur uh, Conan Doyle based Sherlock Holmes on Sir Robert Anderson. But Sir Robert Anderson said, The fifth chapter of Ephesians, moreover, ought to be accepted as making an end of the controversy on the subject. The marriage relationship is there readjusted by a heavenly standard. If therefore the church were the bride, that's a typo there, it should say were, not where. If the church were the bride, we should find it asserted here with emphatic prominence. But it is the body relationship that is emphasized. Christ loved the church, and the church is his body. Therefore, a Christian is to love his wife as his own body. And the 31st verse of the ordinance of Genesis 2.24 is reenacted for the Christian with a new sanction and new meaning. The great mystery of verse 32 is not that a man and his wife are one body, for such a use of the word mystery is foreign to Scripture. And moreover, the apostle uh, says expressly, I'm speaking about Christ and the, and the... Man, there's all kind of typos in here. I apologize. That was my fault. <laughs> I, I dictated this into it, so, you know, sometimes Microsoft has, un, has a hard time with my speech. Um, moreover, the apostle says expressly, I'm speaking about Christ and the church, and the last verse of the chapter disposes of the whole question. Nevertheless, though a man and wife are not one body, yet because Christ and the church are one body, let every one of you love his wife even as himself. And so again... It is similar, but it's not the same. There's a difference. Uh, in marriage, husband and wife become one flesh, but they're still two different people. In the church, he is our, we are crucified with him, buried with him, and raised with him because he's, he is our identity. We're completely identified with him as members of himself. Okay, that's distinct. And you say, well, so what people do is they say, well, as a man and his wife are one flesh, and so, but again, that, that, that is not the same thing. Now, he's using it to teach us that there's a similarity, and he's making a practical application, but when you study God's relationship with Israel, why would you want that when ours is even better? We have a greater and higher position. So it's important to note that little word as. Seven times in the passage he says as, <laughs> okay? Paul did not say the church is the bride of Christ. Now Israel is spoken of many times in the Bible as a woman. The church, the body of Christ, never is. It's, a, it's one new what? Man. Now, Paul said in verse 23, that Christ is the Savior of the body. If this was a doctrinal passage about the church being the bride, wouldn't it have been better to say he's the Savior of his bride? But it says his body. Now look 
in verse 25, or uh, excuse me, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. And I guess people think that's talking about the wedding dress or something. Or any such thing that should be without, holy and without blemish. What's he talking about? Presenting himself where? Presenting it to himself where? We will be presented at the judgment seat of Christ when the Lord catches away the church and we give an account of how we serve the Lord and that determines our reward in His heavenly kingdom and how we reign with Him, we'll be presented as full-grown adopted sons. Okay, that's the issue in this epistle. Look back in chapter 1, verse 4. Chapter 1, verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him. He didn't say chosen us to be in Him, by the way. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Is that the same thing as in Ephesians 5? Yes. Having predestinated us, you don't get predestinated until you get saved. Once you're in the body of Christ, the body of Christ is predestined to a certain position. Under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. Adoption is not taking in a stranger into the family, not biblical adoption. That's, that's a modern sense of the word, but in the biblical sense, it's got to do with one who is in the family entering into full... Uh, it's, it, it's an issue of maturity that you've entered into this position with all its rights and privileges being a full-grown son of God. So we're going to be presented as adopted sons. Ephesians 4.13 says, as a perfect man... All right, presenting it to himself in that he's fitted us now to reign with him in his heavenly kingdom. And look, the things we did that was wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ and, and it'll be forever gone. Only the gold, silver, and precious stone remains. And so we will be without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, talking about we're fitted for this position, but the presentation According to Colossians 1, and I'm not going to turn there for time's sake, but you can read in Colossians 1 about the judgment seat of Christ and the term is used being presented. Colossians 1, 21 to 23, also at the end of the chapter, verse 27 and 28. 2 Corinthians 4, 14 talks about upon the rapture being presented to the Lord. And so this is upon the rapture at the judgment seat of Christ and then when we go out into our positions in His heavenly kingdom, but we are presented as full-grown sons, not as a bride. By the way, he said a glorious church, not a glorious bride. Now, what was the mystery? Paul said, I, th verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Well, that can't be the bride because the bride is the subject of prophecy. It's not a mystery. What is the mystery? Verse 30, we're members of his body. That's the mystery. <laughs> we are members of his body. That is the issue. The bride is the subject of prophecy. A mystery is a secret that cannot be known until God reveals it. And the mystery of the body of Christ was first revealed to Paul. It's not a prophetic thing that you read about concerning the bride. These are two different issues. Ephesians 3, again, we're, you know, we won't... I want to look at a couple other passages real quick before we close. So I'm not going to cover everything I wanted to. I just don't have time. But you know Ephesians 3 is very clear. The body of Christ was a mystery first revealed to Paul. So, I understand, look, I'm not trying to be mean. I understand you go back there, there's Adam and Eve, and you know, because, you know, the Lord took the rib out of his side, and that picture is the cross, and now he's got his bride. And I understand all that, I've heard all that preaching. But we, in this age, we can be likened figuratively, okay? I have no problem with that. But there's a difference between seeing a figure and applying it and saying doctrinally we are the fulfillment of this prophecy about the bride. That's, that, you're making an illogical jump in, uh, to conclusions there. Look in Romans 7. I'll, I'll, I'll refute right now that we're the bride in Revelation 9. I think I already did, but I'm going to do it from Romans 7. Real quick, got five minutes. I'm going to look at Romans 7, 2 Corinthians 11. We'll wrap it up. See, this is the only two... If the church... In this age is the bride, it would be in Paul's epistles because the body of Christ that God's building in this age is only found in Paul's epistles, right? So people say, well, he does teach it. It's in Ephesians 5. That's not the, the once again, for, for emphasis, 
The whole point in Ephesians 5 is a practical application of doctrine that Christ and His church are one body. Now you can apply that in your marriage and say, as Christ loved the church, husbands love your wives. As the church is subject to Christ, wives be to your husbands. That's all that is. It's not saying the marriage relationship illustrates the bride of Christ. That's not what's going on. You're making it say that. And if the church was the bride, that would have been the place to put it, right? And he didn't. You read it into it because you've been listening to gospel music. Okay? I like gospel music, but don't get your doctrine from it. <laughs> so, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know, uh, know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, hath the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law so that she is no more adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who's raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, in the passage here, uh, Paul used marriage as an illustration to explain how we're free from the law. The woman is set free from her husband by death. A husband and wife are one flesh, and death dissolves that union. The application is that our old man is crucified with Christ, and therefore we're free to be joined to Christ. Upon salvation, we are spiritually circumcised, loose from the flesh, and baptized spiritually into Christ being one with Him, so the husband does not represent the law. The husband in the, in the illustration represents the flesh. The flesh is the problem. The flesh was condemned by the law, but now that the flesh is dead, we're in Christ who fulfilled the law, and that means we're dead to the law. All right, get this. Marriage is used in the passage for an illustration, not to teach a doctrinal thing about the church being the bride. If it were to be taken literally, that would mean we were married to our flesh before we are saved. That's, that's the, you know, it's obviously he's just using an illustration. And since we're one with the Lord now upon salvation, that's likened unto being married. But see, in Revelation 19, the marriage is not consummated until the second coming. But we are already, Paul said, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, 1 Corinthians 6. That happens when you get saved. That doesn't happen for Israel until they go through the tribulation. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? These are different things. So you can use an illustration, and, but to, to then say, well, because Paul used the illustration of marriage, then we're the bride in prophecy, that's illogical nonsense, okay? 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, and we'll finish with this. Verse 1, would to God you could be, uh, bear with me a little of my folly, indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. And he's talking to a local church here, that I may present you as, big word, two letters, but has a big importance, <laughs> as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds, and that's the battlefield, the spiritual warfare, should be corrupted. From the simplicity that is in Christ. So the false teachers that sought to influence the church at Corinth against Paul and his message boasted themselves as being the, the true messengers of God when in reality Paul exposes them in this passage as being ministers of Satan. And in the context, Paul sarcastically used the foolishness of boasting to make a point and get their attention. He said, you're listening to these boasters? I'll do a little boasting. Why don't you listen to what I have to say? But he's talking about his responsibility as a minister of Christ, and he compares it to one who espouses a bride to a bridegroom. In the Jewish culture, this man had the responsibility to make sure the bride stayed pure during the betrothal. And so he knew that Satan's goal was to deceive and corrupt the church. And so Paul wanted the church to stay doctrinally and morally pure. So he's, he, once again, it's an illustration. He says, as. He's speaking Figuratively, Paul told the same church that he was their father. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14 and 15. He also told the churches at Galatia he was their mother. 
in Galatians 4.19. These are figures of speech. He's saying as. Now, if you say no, that means we are the bride. Now you've got the Apostle Paul not being in the bride of Christ. Because if he's the one who espoused the bride, he's not in the bride, is he? Do you think about, think about what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. Is Paul in the body of Christ? So if the body of Christ is the bride, what's Paul doing outside the bride? It won't work. I'm telling you. I, look, we're joined to the Lord. So you can use marriage as an illustration. But we're not waiting to be joined. We are joined. Israel won't be permanently joined until that new covenant is made. That's future. So you have, look, Israel's called God's, um, he said over there, Israel is my son, my firstborn, in Exodus 4, verse 22. But he uses the figure of a bride with Israel a lot. And then he's promising to take her back as a bride in the future. That's fulfilled in the book of Revelation. So because Paul did use some figures also, you can't then say, well, we're the fulfillment of that prophecy. See, that is not how you study the Bible. Because Paul didn't say doctrinally we are the bride. We are the body. The body is not the same thing as the bride. And just because in marriage two become one doesn't mean you can jump to the conclusion it's the same thing to say we're the bride and the body. Because still and yet, when two become one, it's still two. It's not the same person. But we are literally, completely identified with Christ in a higher position than Israel. So you don't lose nothing by letting them have what's theirs and understanding who you are in the body. There's so much more to say, but time is up, so we'll stop there. Father, thank you for the time we had in your word. I know this is kind of controversial because of tradition. But help us to just search the scriptures and see whether it's so. In Jesus' name.